How's it going everyone? It is May 20th. I'm not exactly sure when I'm going to release this reading. Hopefully this month. In order to uh, pay my respects. Or to inform people of the 50th anniversary of the Kent State shooting 50 years ago. Uh, killing four and wounding nine people. This was a shooting from by National Guardsmen on uh, innocent college students protesting the Vietnam War. <coughs> The anniversary actually falls on May 4th and Gene Herbrick has a pretty cool recollection of this uh, incident. Dean R. Caller, Caller first college semester was nearing an end when he went home for the weekend 50 years ago this month to celebrate his 20th birthday. The Northeast Ohio country boy had worked on the Republic Steel Melt Shop in Canton to help pay for school and get a late start on college. He had a high draft number, so he wasn't worried about going to Vietnam. He looked forward to four years of academics to launch his chosen career in public services. When he returned to campus Sunday afternoon, everything had changed. Two days of anti-war demonstrations culminated in the torching of a campus military building. The governor, the governor came to town vowing to restore order and called in the Ohio National Guard. Curfews were set and armed troops patrolled the grounds. And within 24 hours, on May 4th, 1970, Keller's world would forever change amid a violent combustion that put a hard time stamp on the end of the 1960s and delivered the war to the doorsteps of America's heartland. That's when guardsmen opened fire on a crowd of students at Kent State University, killing four and wounding nine, including Keller, who suffered a spinal cord injury that permanently paralyzed him from the chest down. Kent, Ohio hardly seemed the likely setting for such a social political upheaval. It was a sleepy little town, said Bill Gordon, a local author and expert on the topic. Gordon grew up in Ohio but went to UCLA Shit, for college. He was drawn back to Kent State after the shootings. Upon graduating in 1973, he set out to write Four Dead in Ohio. In which, follow me to page four, in which he tried to get to the bottom of what happened and why. The police and the guardsmen weren't very prepared or sophisticated, said Gordon, who lived for years in Laguna Hill and now makes his home in Rancho Mirage. Keller has other ideas. Now Keller's the guy, he's the actual victim that's paralyzed now. When you consider the location of Kent, it's surrounded by Akron, Canton, Cleveland, and Youngstown, Keller said in a recent interview with the Southern California News Group. Those are not exactly hotbeds of liberal thought. Then again, Keller said, if you wanted to put an end to people who are disagreeing with you as a government, why not do it where the excuse me, why not do it where middle America works and lives, right in the heartland of the state of Ohio? That might have been part of the grand plan of Ohio Governor James Rhodes or President Richard Nixon. Gordon isn't so sure. He says, I know a lot of people believe that, the author said in a recent interview. There's no evidence to support that. There's nothing in Nixon's files or anything else in literature which supports it. Nixon had announced on Thursday, April 30th, that he was sending U.S. forces into Cambodia, breaking a promise and spawning protests across the nation. On Friday, Kent students rallied peacefully, but bonfires and looting that night near a row of bars downtown spilled back into the campus, leading to the burning of an ROTC barracks on Saturday. When Keller returned Sunday afternoon, he said he was disheartened by the chaos and the lack of direction from the university or student governance organizations. There was a lot, there's, <clears throat> there was lots of misinformation and conflicting information Sunday, he said. Even the graduate students who lived in my floor didn't know what the hell was going on. A student rally was set for noon Monday and Keller, who says he is anti-war by virtue of his pacifist, 
pacifist religious belief, but not a radical chose to attend. I was hoping somebody from the university would come and speak to us and give us some guidance, he said, but none of that was happening. We were met with nothing more than get off campus, you're not allowed here, get out of this area. The university really missed a chance to work with the students. Instead, National Guard troops were on the march with M1 rifles and fixed bayonets, launching tear gas to try to disperse the crowd. They were chasing us around, Keller said, describing the guardsmen's march up Blanket Hill next to Taylor Hall, home of the College of Liberal Arts, and down the other side to a practice athletic field where they huddled, apparently deciding their next move. They retraced their steps and started back up the hill, parting the sea of students. By this time, it was almost 20 after, Keller said, and I knew I had to get ready to go to my 1.10 p.m. class. That was my ultimate destination to stop at the student center hub, grab a cup of coffee, and walk across the street to my class. Once they got to the top of the hill, I was at the bottom of the hill. I saw them turn with full deliberation, pull their rifles up to their shoulders, and start shooting. I had nowhere to hide, so I just jumped on the ground and was surrounded by bullets, it seemed like. I couldn't believe why they were shooting or shooting at me in particular. I was a football field away from them. When he was hit, Keller said it felt like a bee sting, sting, and my legs got tight. <clears throat> excuse me, and my legs got tight and then relaxed. So I knew I was hit, but the bullets kept coming. I was hoping I wouldn't get hit again, and I knew immediately I had a spinal cord injury. At 12:22 p.m. that May 4th. 26 Ohio National Guardsmen from the 145th Infantry and the 107th Armored Cavalry Regiments fired 59 shots at the group of students demonstrators in a 13-second volley. Killed were Allison B. Krause, 19 years old, Jeffrey Glenn Miller, 20, both protesters. Also deceased were William Knox Schroeder, 19 years old, and ROTC scholar and Sandra Lee Schur, 20 years old, both bystanders on their way to class. Miller was the closest to the guard at 265 feet. Schur, at 390 feet, was the farthest away. By nightfall, the campus was evacuated and the school was closed. In the aftermath, 24 students and one faculty member, the Kent 25, were charged in the demonstration and the burning of the ROTC building. A few were convicted, but most charges were dismissed. Eight guardsmen were indicted. Indict, indicted. <laughs> Eight guardsmen were indicted by a grand jury, but their claim of self-defense was generally accepted, and charges were dismissed before the case went to trial. Federal civil action for wrongful death brought by the victims and their families against guardsmen, the state, and the president of Kent State resulted in unanimous verdicts on all counts. But the case was reversed on appeal and settled out of court for $675,000 and a statement of regret. But questions persist 50 years later, particularly why the guardsmen felt the need to open fire when the protesters were so far away. Was there an order to the fire? Gordon had thought for years that someone, a guardsman perhaps, would come forward to fill in the blanks, but now acknowledges that was just wishful thinking. I think a lot of the secrets went to the graves with all the main com commanders who were there, Gordon said, but I still think there had to be an an order to fire because of the way so many witnesses said that they turned in synchronicity. Roger De Paolo thinks Gordon's contention is valid. Paolo, a Kent State uh, native, 1977 graduate and longtime editor of his hometown newspaper, The Record Courier, goes further. I think there were at least a few of those guardsmen who had targets, said DePaulo. Now retired, injured student Alan Canfora 
waving that black flag was a real easy target. The preface to the new edition of Gordon's book include the latest on the FBI's conclusion that the tape of the shooting did not reveal an order to fire. It turns out that the FBI used software that was seven generations older than what the computer experts at the time were using. The National Guard, excuse me, the National Academy of Sciences could probably clarify the issue by retesting the tape with whatever the latest technology is out there, Gordon said, but no one is pressing the issue or interested in following up. Gordon has been critical of what he sees as the university's lack of interest in getting to the bottom of things. He thinks the May 4 Visitor Center, which opened in 2014, despite a thorough overview of the times and events, doesn't address the questions head on. It gives short shrift to the struggles for justice at Kent State or the search for the truth at Kent, Gordon said. It didn't even acknowledge there was still a controversy. Nobody there was actually interested in it. The faculty seemed to lack any curiosity about what happened on May 4th. Still, Gordon acknowledges that the history has largely been written by now. The only thing that hasn't been explored are the stories of the National Guardsmen. I never felt satisfied that they were, that they were telling the truth, he said. But there have to be some people who know. There's just no incentive for anyone to come clean at this point. Gordon thinks the 50th anniversary is the last hurrah for the radicals and the case is going to be dead after this, finally. It's amazing that it lasted as long as it did. There was never any closure for anyone and that's why it kept going on and on and on. No one got satisfactory answers to why it happened and there was no sense of justice. It has taken the university decades to come to grips with its dark place in history. The university, after years of hoping May 4th would just go away and then literally burying it with the construction of a gymnasium annex in 1978 that altered the landscape, finally came to terms with the fact that it was history, DePaulo says. And of course that comes with the passing of time. And finally you had presidents. Lester Lefton, who left in 2014, was one. His successor, Beverly Warren, was another, who finally understood it wasn't going away and that remembering the tragedy is not celebrating it. But DePaulo says that after every May 4th commemoration, when he would play coverage on the front page of his newspaper, he would invariably get the calls the next day from some readers. The same ones many of us who covered this story have gotten over the years. Why are you glorifying this? Why don't you let it die and go away? And they should have just shot them all, DePaulo says. They're still around, they're just a lot older, those people aren't ever going to change. Keller agrees the university has made strides in confronting its history. The administration has opened its doors to the victims and parents. The visitor center lays the story out and the May 4 history is taught in various parts of the curriculum. But there is still more healing that needs to be done, Keller said. You know, we're only 50 years away from it, so the true understanding of it is still in its infancy. The 50th anniversary commemoration events, which were to feature a speech by Jane Fonda, were canceled because of the coronavirus pandemic and will be reduced to a virtual ceremony online. Keller was set, along with Tom Grace, another wounded student, to deliver the commencement address on May 9th, but that also has been canceled. His message to graduates is just the message I've been talking about for 50 years, said the former Athens, Ohio County Commissioner. Be involved in your government. Hold your, off, hold your officials accountable and vote. If you're not registered, get registered and then be, informed, vote, be an informed voter. You have to hold your government accountable or they'll take advantage of you. For his part, Keller has long since made peace with his place as, living, as a living symbol of a tragic historical event. I'm an old man now. 
but I keep it in the same context that I kept it in for all these past 50 years. It was one bad day in my life that changed my life, he says. I'm very thankful that I'm alive and that I could go on and be productive, a productive being and a member of society in a positive way. I look at it as a historical thing, but I don't make it the focus of my life.